All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for making time to join us on this Monday evening. I'm Steve Edwards with the Institute of Politics, and pleased to welcome you to tonight's conversation featuring Washington correspondent for Time Magazine, Jay Newton-Small. And I want to talk a little bit uh, about some upcoming events here at the IOP before we uh, and my colleague Alicia Sams jump into it. Um, Katie Weebazal will get us kicked off formally with introducing both of our, our guests on the program today. But I want to remind you that tomorrow night we're going to have a debate uh, here on campus that the IOP is co-hosting with the organization FIRE looking at the Second Amendment and specifically gun rights versus gun control um, and where is the line, if any, for where those two sides that seem to be so polarized can actually come together on gun policy. So that should be a very timely and important debate that will be taking place tomorrow night uh, at 6 p.m. On Wednesday, our international policy program, which is focused on students, so for students in the audience here, we're doing a conversation with three interesting observers, including our own fellow, uh, Maria Latella, looking at the 2016 presidential campaign from abroad, international perspectives on how they're reading this election. So that'll take place at noon at the IOP on Wednesday. And then Thursday night, the untold history of the United States through the prism of Academy Award winning filmmaker Oliver Stone, uh, who will be talking about that project and his long work in politically inspired films, biographical and otherwise. So that is Thursday night at 5 o'clock. That'll take place at Max Pilevsky, the Doc Films location in Idanoi. So three big events coming up in addition to tonight getting us kicked off. So to get our program started tonight, um, please join me in welcoming Katie to the podium, who's a third year political science major, been very active in the IOP throughout her time on campus as an events MBA ambassador helping to coordinate events like this and also very active in our women in public service program so perfectly situated to get our conversation off tonight talking about broad influence here you are hello thank you for coming it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker time magazine washington correspondent jay newton small ms newton small has covered a broad range of news for times ranging from Washington politics to foreign policy to national trends, and has written more than a half dozen cover stories for the magazine. The child of United Nations diplomats, she spent her childhood living abroad in Asia, Africa, and Europe. She studied international relations and art history as an undergraduate at Tufts University before obtaining her MS in journalism from Columbia. Ms. Newton Small began her journalism career by covering the UN in Washington, DC for the AFP. She has also worked for Bloomberg News, covering the White House, Congress, and the 04 presidential campaign. In addition, Ms. Newton Small was the 2015 Harvard Institute of Politics Fellow and is currently a fellow with the New America Foundation. Newton Small's important new book, Broad Influence, How Women Are Changing the Way America Works, looks at how women can affect change once they reach a critical mass in an organization. Today's discussion will expand on the themes of her book and how women are fundamentally changing how politics and government operates. This message is particularly timely in 2016, not only because there is the potential for the first female president of the United States, but also due to the fact that single women are poised to be one of the most pivotal voting groups in the 2016 election. Their voices and ideas will have a real impact shaping the next generation of government. I want to take this time to thank you all for joining us this evening. This evening's discussion will be moderated by the IOP's director of the speaker series, Alicia Sams. Now please join me in welcoming Jay Newton-Small as she explains why a new generation of women are reaching across the aisles and affecting lasting change in Washington and across the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. That was a wonderful introduction. <laughs> So, um, Jay, can you tell us I want, uh, your origination story, how this book project came to be? Sure. Um, so first I want to say thank you so much for having me here um, at the Chicago IOP. I'm very excited to see our Western cousins from Harvard, <laughs> um, and uh, um, especially David Axelrod for bringing me here, and Alicia, who I covered the 2008 campaign with, and we're covering the Obama side of the 2008 campaign with. So it's so great to catch up with you. It's fun. Um, so uh, I originally got the idea for this book. Um, I was 
Uh, I was writing, I did a story in 2000, about two and a half years ago during, in 2013 about the government shutdown and about the women of the Senate coming together during the shutdown to restart the negotiations to reopen the government when none of the men would talk to each other. Um, and I had a lot of interest in writing a book out of that, but all of the um, senators were all writing their own books and did not need one from me. Um, <laughs> but what interested me most about that episode was that it was the first time the Senate was 20% women. And they ended up having a really huge impact. They ended up actually producing 75% of the legislation that passed that session, which was just phenomenal. And as somebody who'd covered Congress sort of on and off for the better part of 12 or 13 years at that point, um, I, you could really feel the difference of the vibe in the institution and how things were being run very differently. Um, and so I, it, was, it was actually, I got more mail from that one piece that I'd written um, about the women of the Senate than I'd gotten for any other story that I've ever written for a time. And that includes two cover stories on Sarah Palin. So that tells you how much mail that was. Um, and, uh, and, and it was just phenomenal. Like women from acro across the country wrote to me about how great it was to hear that women were finally making a difference, that they were impacting things. Um, and, and I had a lot of women who wrote to me saying, well, I've had really similar experiences in my work area, right? Like that, you know, when we got to this sort of tipping point of, of representation that we really, there was a different atmosphere and things began to change. And so I had um, one woman who wrote to me who was uh, part of the 30% Club, which is a group in, in, uh, in New York that tries to get, their aim is to get 30% um, women on all corporate boards. And they have all this amazing research that shows that when you get to 30% women on corporate boards, there was this huge impact, right? Like they ended up, um, um, the like, companies, and this is amazing, companies were like 26% more efficient. They uh, were 55, uh, they were 45% more profitable. I mean, God, who 45% more profitable, who would not want that? And, um, and, and they had to restate their earnings 55% less. And so there's all these compelling reasons why you should have women on boards. And there was a woman in the Navy who wrote to me about um, how the Navy ships, when they, you know, had, when they first integrated in 1973, had sort of tried and failed to integrate women. It was sort of a handful at a time, or one or two. It was a total disaster. And they really struck upon finally critical mass, where it was like 25. They now mandate a minimum of 20 with a goal of 25% on every ship in the, in the Navy because it's a real ch change. Like it's a real, it's sort of nor everything normalizes and people aren't like weirdly like, oh, that's the woman. And it's kind of weird, right? So, um, and so, um, so I got really interested in this idea and I started researching it and I, um, and I uh, decided to write a book about critical mass and just collect in one place all these examples where women were reaching critical mass and how they were changing things. And then the book also looks at all the places where we're really far away from it and why it's important to get there um, in sort of industries like Silicon Valley and Wall Street. When you start your book in the West Wing and you go into sort of um, how there were, there were women appointed but they weren't being heard, mm -hmm. how did that narrative unfold in the West Wing and what, what do you think sort of brought the women to the realization that, that there was something they could do to become part of a, a, bi a bigger impact on us? legislation. That I really loved that chapter because it was like watching critical mass unfold in front of you. It was so cool. So they actually had the numbers to begin with. So 39% of the West Wing is women, actually. Um, and at least in that, in that, it's actually even more now. I think it's approaching 50. Mm -hmm. um, and like it's totally run by women these days. It's like such a sisterhood. <laughs> um, and like, um, but at the time, they had 39% coming into the administration, but they didn't know each other. So some of them came from Chicago, some came from California, some came from New York, some from DC, and they, were, they knew each other in sort of groups, but they didn't really, they weren't a, co a cohesive group. And they really had a miserable time, their first sort of nine months of the administration. And they felt like it was a total boys club, they felt shut out of everything, they, um, they really didn't, like they, they really felt like it was, I mean, frankly, again, a boys club. And so there were a lot of complaints early on in the Obama administration about how the women were treated badly. And in fact, things got so bad that in November of 2009, Obama had a dinner hosting all the senior women in the White House in his residence, and they like laid out all the ways in which they'd been excluded from decisions and not um, not having an impact. And he was actually kind of unsympathetic. He was kind of like, you know what, kind of like the men are doing what I need them to do, and you guys need to step it up. And um, and he basically almost offhandedly said, why don't you guys start having dinner? You know, like just get to know each other and start helping each other out. And they did do that. They started to have regular dinners, and that really made a difference. They they really um, started talking about their shared frustrations and their shared histories and their shared kind of experiences, and they started to 
solve a lot of their problems together. So, and I'm, I'm sure every woman in the room has had this experience where like, you'll be in a meeting and a guy, and you'll say something and everyone will be like, uh-huh, and then like 10 minutes later, a guy will say the exact same thing and everyone's like, oh my God, genius. <laughs> and you're like, I just said that, you know, and like, and so they would, they started protecting each other that way, and they'd be like, you know what, that is a great point, but Kathy had that same point like 10 minutes ago, and wasn't a genius when Kathy said that, right? Um, or when they found out that they were being excluded from meetings, they would call each other or text each other and be like, hey, we're in the Roosevelt room, like, come on down, <laughs> and like, you know, and if the women couldn't make it, they would take notes and be like, here's what was decided, you should like be up to speed, like, and so they really started helping each other out, and they, they, they talked about wardrobes, like what to wear, what's, you know, what's appropriate, like, you know, when you're like going out drinking, they started talking about, you know, with, with colleagues and they started, and, and they talked about being comfortable, frankly, in the room where, I mean, the White House is working, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. There's so much going on. You're always working on like maybe 25% information, but you've got an entire sort of administration there to provide the other 75% and nail down on the details. But you have to get comfortable very quickly in working with and making decisions and, and really fast paced sort of discussions on very little information. And the men would be like, have like 5% information to be like, yeah, this is what we should do, right? And like, and the women would be like, I can't say anything until I have 75% information. And they just wouldn't talk, right? And so they would, they had, they kind of coached each other into like talking up and like getting up and saying, you need to like actually engage, you know? And like, even if you don't have all the information, the men do it. Like Carol Browner told me, <laughs> she had this like horrifying realization where she was spending, when she was in the Clinton administration in the cabinet, she would spend like days agonizing over what she would say in cabinet meetings. And then she was talking to one of her male colleagues before a cabinet meeting. She'd be like, so what did you prepare to say? And he was like, I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. And she was like, oh my god. <laughs> like, you, know? Like, you know, that's like horrifying. Um, and so, <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, and they, they talked about being at the table, right? Which in, in these little rooms in the White House, um, it's like the, the map room or the Roosevelt room, you have like one table and then everyone else stands around on the side and there's chairs along the side and all the women would kind of meekly stand along the side or in the chairs on the wall and they would like coach each other, like go take a chair at the table, gotta be at the table, you know, and they would give each other advice. Like if, some, if copies have to be made in your principal, do not get up and get the copies. Like do not, do not do anything, do not make copies, don't like, you know, like that. There, is, there are people there to do that. Do not, like you are there to be a principal and like, and don't try to help that out. And so there's like, they had all this great advice for each other and they ended up really, really coming together and being like forcing to them, like the men to hear them. And the, the chapter ends with, and I don't wanna like totally ruin the book so, cause you should read it, but like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the chapter ends with this great, my, one like, it's my favorite scene in the book where um, there were these, it was, the, it was the, the grand bargain talks of 2011 and it was a Sunday, and it was uh, the president was meeting in the Oval Office with um, Larry Summers, I think, and David Plouffe. And they were really, and they'd found out about this meeting that it was happening, and there were three women who had felt consistently cut out of the process. And it was um, the two deputy chiefs of staff, Nancy and DeParle, who was in charge of all policy. So you couldn't have a deal without her because she was in charge of all policy. <laughs> um, and like, and Melissa Mastromonaco, who was in charge of the budget. So you also couldn't have a deal without her because she ran the budget. And, um, and then Stephanie Cutter, who ran all messaging at that time for the White House. And so they were like, this is ridiculous. We keep getting cut out of these things. So they were like, we're just gonna, you know what? We're just gonna walk in. And so they gathered in front of the Oval Office and they just walked in uninvited and sat down and the president was like, hi guys. And they were like, hi. <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and nobody said anything and they just continued the meeting like normal. And, but the men got the point and they were like, they were gonna not gonna be shut out anymore. And if you're gonna shut us out, we were just gonna walk in. Um, and like, it was, it's really fun now because I, I've done a bunch of panels with women in the West Wing Herd now in the second administration. And they're like, it's a total yeah guy sisterhood. The whole place is run by women. It's like, they're like, it's totally different. It's like really, so they're, they're kind of, they're like, it's funny to read it now for them because they're like, that seems like such ancient history. It's so different now. It's, I love that scene too because I can totally see the Hollywood movie, right? Where they walk in and they <laughs> yeah. sit down and start talking. So that's, you know, these are accomplished women and they are in the, in the White House. So they're all basically on the same team, right? I mean, I know there's disagreements, but they're all basically working for the same goal. How, do, how did it work differently in the Senate when you had Republicans and Democrats coming together, albeit more Democrats and Republicans? What was kind of, what made that work and why do you think the women were so much more effective at getting things done than the men? 
Um, so the women were really good at, um, we were talking about this earlier, really good at, um, at frankly, getting together. So Washington used to be this place, you know, Tip O'Neill, who was Speaker of the House, and Ronald Reagan used to be friend, quote unquote, friends after six. And it used to be a place where people lived and they brought their families and members, knew each other very well, and they would go out and socialize. But starting the Newt Gingrich days in sort of the mid-90s, they changed the, um, the budgets and how much money members got for staffing and for travel. And the Republicans began to really encourage their members to go home more and spend more time outside the Beltway. And that has led to a kind of breakdown in friendships, frankly, um, not just across the aisle, but even amongst your own party. I mean, they just don't spend that much time in Washington anymore. They they bolt for the exits the minute they gavel out, and um, they just don't know each other at all. They didn't, and, and the, but the women, as a minority, have been making this kind of concerted effort to be friends and to get together and to really um, to, to work together and to like get to know each other as friends because they felt like they needed allies and they just needed the support and the friendship. And so um, they got together every month, you know, for like 25 years they've been doing it. And, um, and they, they have this very strong like bipartisan group where they, they don't talk about anything that's partisan. They, they talk a lot more about like husbands and cooking and crazy people who they work with and like, and just kind of get along. But, and, but it has led to a huge amount of legislation. And so um, I think that they've, they've built these friendships. And, and the women I think are, you know, and are better at this in the sense that they want to know who they're working with, right? Like they want to have drinks with people, they want to like have lunch with people, they want to like get to know you. All of the chairs, like so, the the women of the Senate were so powerful in that session because um, they ended up either chairing or ranking on eleven of the twenty committees, um, and so they were very powerful. But all of those ranking members and 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 ch and chairs insisted on like a weekly or monthly basis of getting to, of like eating with their Republican counterparts, right? Even if they were men, they were like, we have to get to know each other. We like, and they would insist on visiting each other in, in their states and meeting their kids and like really getting to know each other in ways that men just didn't anymore or they don't anymore. And so um, a lot of, you know, and so they've developed these friendships and that then spilled over into legislating and, and, and they would, you know, and they it would create these really oddball couples like Barbara Boxer and James Inhofe from, you know, he's like this very conservative Republican from Oklahoma who's a climate denier and he, and she's like, and he's the chair of the Environment Committee um, and like, and she's like the top Democrat in the Environment Committee and she's obviously this super liberal, you know, Democrat from California, but they love each other. It's like really hilarious and they like have this whole sports rivalry going on where they like rib each other about sports and unfortunately you know in Hoff's son died during um, in the last few years and she like went to his funeral and like they were very close and when his dog died she called him and like they were very so they've become sort of buddies and they and they're you know even they can agree very vociferously uh, you know off on the record but they also can meet they're also friends and so and you don't see that that much more in Washington. It just doesn't happen that much. And, um, and it's really only with the women, I would argue. I mean, there are a few examples of some, some male friendships, but the women have the best, most powerful examples of like really functional bipartisan friendships um, in, in Congress, which is really great to see. And why do you think that's not, I mean, why is that not covered more? I know it, it's not sexy to say, hey, these people get along, but. <laughs> Functional. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What What's wrong with I think exploring a functional relationship? Um, that's a great question. I mean, and like I, um, I was actually so the the story that I wrote about the Senate this in the, in this book was about Patty Murray and Paul Ryan's relationship and how they got a budget together and sort of ended the fiscal cliffs and the lurching and all this you know the the sort of um, government shutdowns and and. Um, and I was surprised when I was selling the excerpts of the book that Elle magazine approached me and asked me to excerpt that chapter particularly. And they were like, and I was like, that surprises me. I mean, I thought they would go for like the Hollywood chapter or like, you know, um, like, you know, one of the other kind of sexier chapters. And they were like, we really just loved the idea of writing a story about functionality in Washington. And I was like, <laughs> wow, OK. Um, and so I was, I was very surprised by that. And they ran 5,000 words of functionality in Washington. So I was, I was, it was kind of amazing. But um, it, it is, it's true that it's not, it's not sexy as like the bomb throwing and the government shutdown and like the dysfunction. Um, and it is, it's a lot of a quiet work behind the scenes. I mean, it's like meal by meal. It's, you know, it's like little bill by little bill that builds into bigger bills. I mean, and it's these little things that sort of help. I mean, they they throw each other like 
you know, Susan Collins got married for the first time ever when she was like 58 years old, and it was like they had like bridal showers for her, you know, and like, um, and you know, and, and Hillary Clinton was one of the co-hosts, and. Um, even though Susan Collins is a Republican, and they have baby showers and grandbaby showers, and they, I mean, like, and so it isn't the kind of, like, poker, smoked-filled, like, cigar rooms that you imagine Washington to be. It's this very different image of it, and so um, I don't know. I don't know why it's not. I wish it were more popular right Would now. it hurt Jim yeah. Inhofe in Oklahoma if people knew that he was friends with Barbara Boxer? I, you know, I wonder about that sometimes. I mean, it definitely hurts Paul Ryan when, when people talk about his friendship with Patty Murray um, yeah, because you have to be seen as more adversarial. Like, you have to be seen as, you know, as a much, and, and that's the interesting thing is that, and this kind of gets into the executive office question, but, um, you know, women are seen as really great at collaborating. I mean, like, this is studies show, and obviously every woman is not the same. That's, like, a major caveat here. But studies show that women are generally more collaborative um, and, and much better at win-win scenarios and much better at consensus building. And men are better at win-lose scenarios, zero-sum games, and executive command and control decision-making, right? And so what increasingly people are looking for in this gladi like very adversarial sort of gladiatorial kind of atmosphere is win lose scenarios like right zero sum games there's a winner and there's a loser and you got like and they want to slay the other side right like they want to just decimate them um, and the women aren't like that on either side of the aisle like they're like i want to find a way i mean patty murray point blank the way the way they got to this deal was she was like i knew she said i knew i had to find a win for paul and a win for me and i knew i had to lose some and he had to lose some other Otherwise, there wasn't going to be a deal, and that is the art of legislating. I mean, that there's there's no way you're never going to. We're a two-party system, people. We're never going to kill the other side, right? Like it's just not possible. Um, but increasingly, the appetite is there for this kind of, you know, blood on the other side of the aisle. Like we must. We, it's like a zero-sum game in a lot of people's minds and a lot of voters' minds, and it's very unpopular to to for it to be seen as compromise is a bad word, right? And that's. I think it's a tough environment for people to. Formed by partisan friendships in many ways. Yeah. So, but then you you do talk about leadership, and before we jump to sort of the big Kahuna, um, <laughs> Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. Um, that's an, another really interesting chapter. Yeah. And it's not about critical mass. No. So it's about it's about critical actors, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, the reason why critical mass isn't like straight up 20% or straight up 30% is because you ha it's a mix of, if it's all just rank and file, like, I mean, 30% of women, quote unquote, work on Wall Street, but th they're mostly like, in, in a lot of those divisions, they're like the secretarial pool, and th that does not count, you know? Like, um, you need to have a critical mass of, uh, that is a mix of rank and file, um, of, but decision makers, they can't be like secretaries. Um, as well as chairs of committees or leaders or critical actors, right? They have to be in some 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 form of leader. So in the Navy, it's you know when they integrate ships, they do officers first because men need to learn how to respect women and take orders from women first, and then they and then they integrate the rank and file. Um, with Pelosi, it was really interesting because she is an example of an executive woman, a woman who is in an executive office, but yet is in a, in a but in a legislative role, right? And so um, and that is it's fast so. Everyone always talks about how America sucks because we can't elect a female president, and like all these other countries in the world have elected female presidents. What you, what they don't talk about is um, most of those countries are either hereditary or parliamentary systems, and so it's very easy to it's much easier, relatively speaking, to elect a woman in a parliamentary system. And if we had had a parliamentary system, Nancy Pelosi would have been president like a decade ago, um, but because she is essentially elected by her party, right, versus um, being elected in a direct democracy, it's very rare for a woman to be elected in a direct democracy anywhere in the world. South America is some exception. I think um, South Korea and some places in Asia are other exceptions, but um, uh, but it is it's it's a harder leap to make in terms of of, of, of winning that office. And so, but but the the power of a critical actor is really important because um, a critical actor can, for example, like Nancy Pelosi, increase female representation in the Democratic caucus in the House from 19 percent to 36 percent almost single-handedly. So she got them to critical mass, and that was you know really important. And you see that also with companies, right? So only less than 5 percent of the Fortune 1000 are run by women, or CEOs have women. But once you get those CEOs into office, they have a huge impact on their workforces. They really they bring a lot of women up with them. They proliferate um, female board members, female executives. So it's it's so important to get that critical act in, actor in there, and that's arguably why it's so important to have a female president because you you ha they bring with them and they have such huge sort of 
bootstraps that a lot of women can come with them or coattails, I don't know how, how best to say it, that, you, that, that um, it's important to get those actors in there. But do you think it does Nancy Pelosi a disservice at all to, to look at her s solely as a woman in power and not just as an incredible pol political figure? And where do those sort of distinctions come into play and in sort of how we think about leadership and leadership qualities? Um, well, I mean, Republicans would certainly say that you should never like make the differentiation, right? I mean, the whole mm -hmm. Republican argument is that you sh that they they hate identity politics and that you should speak and treat everybody with the same voice because everybody is equal in the in the eyes of the law, but no matter of your gender or race or ethnicity or anything else. Um, but ma fact of the matter is, women are different, right? Like you speak to women differently. I mean, Madison Avenue advertisers figured out this figured this out 20 years ago that women were the number one buyers of everything in the house, and they speak and they and you have to make commercials that appeal to them because they digest information differently. So studies show this, our brains act differently. I mean, this is like so, um, so I mean, and Republicans are just beginning to like, and I have a chapter on this as well, but just beginning to figure this out and figure out that they have to speak differently to female voters and speak differently to female politicians, And but it's a process. Um, with Pelosi, I think she argues herself that, you know what I mean, like that, you know, she, her proudest achievement is that she has done so much for women. She talks mm -hmm. constantly about how much she has, you know, done, how much not only she has done, but how much the women she's helped empower have done in office. And I think it's so striking when you think about where we stood as a country um, before the year of the women, before Anita Hill and this sort of, I don't know if you guys know the history of Anita Hill, everyone, yes, confirmation, okay. So before <laughs> Anita Hill in um, 1991, it was like Clarence Thomas's confirmation to the Supreme Court, and Linda Hill was a woman who worked with him, who accused him of sexually harassing her. Um, and she was grilled by this all white, all male Senate panel like on television, and it so pissed off so many millions of women on both sides of the aisle that like thousands of women ran for office because they were like, never again should there be an all white, all male panel like grilling anybody, right? And so created what they call the Year of the Women in 92, which was like a seminal, seminal leap Patty for women. Yeah. So they tripled the number of women in the Senate from like two to six, seven when um, KB, KB Hutchinson was elected a few months later. And the Texas special, um, it, it it like more than it more than increased the female representation in the House by more than sixty percent. State legislatures, I mean, it was this huge leap for women, right? Like it, the number of women going to law school, enrolling in law school, peaked at fifty-two percent um, after the after that hearing, and it has never reached that level since. It's at forty-eight percent now because um, women were so angry, <laughs> like I wanted to happen. It was great, um, and so, <laughs> um, but. Uh, um, and now I've totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, but the, the turning point for women with Nita Hill. Was, yeah, with yeah. Nita Hill. And so, but but um, but, when, but with Pelosi. I mean, yeah. so before that, before that, before women, before that year, women had never sustained a plural presence in the Senate, which is stunning. There was always just one, maybe two, one, maybe two. After that year, they've maintained a plural presence since. But. Um, the year of the women, before that year, there was no Violence Against Women Act. So there was nothing that happened. There were no laws against spousal abuse or abuse of women. There was no, um, there was no, the funding for breast cancer research was $100,000 a year. All research done by the National Institutes of Health were only done on male subjects. Not on, nothing was researched for female subjects. No drug research, nothing, even though our bodies fundamentally, you know, react differently to drugs and procedures and everything else, right? Nothing was done on women. Um, so and this is the 90s, people. Not yeah, this was 1992, <laughs> not right? The this 50s. was amazing, yeah. right? Like um, S chip didn't exist, so the still the state children's health insurance fund. Uh, I mean, there's just the, the the amount of stuff that women have changed and gotten through, and is just amazing when you look at how much has changed in the last 30 years alone or 25 years. And so, um, and and Pelosi talks strongly about how without those voices, that without that diversity, without people to say, this is what, you know, there's no feed, there's no family medical leave, there was no paternity and maternity leave, like there's none of this, right? And so without those voices, you won't, like nobody will actually change these things because it doesn't occur to them. It's not something that affects them, right? And so, and it's so important to have those voices because otherwise nothing will change. And that's why we need to get there in critical mass in so many levels. But it's not just women that are, make, I mean, w by having the women there, they are making, the men look at things differently. I know there's a story in your book where you talk about um, uh, a reaction. Is this Patty Murray? Yeah, yeah. So Patty <laughs> Murray. It was, it was the debate over. It was the debate over paid ma paid family medical leave, and it was 1993. It was one of the first bills that came up, which the women really pushed. They got Teddy Kennedy to champion it, um, and uh, and 
and it was one of the first things they did, and, and, and they had this debate on the floor of the, the ha of the Senate, and Patty Murray got up and talked about talked about this family friend of hers, whose child had died of cancer, and the father had nearly bankrupted the family because he took time off from his job to nurse his child, his dying child, right? Like, and he lost his job, and the family nearly went into bankruptcy. And she was like, "We need protections for people like this man," and you know, because. Like if you you can you should not be punished for wanting to spend six months of the the rest the end of your child's life wanting to spend that time with your child I mean that's terrible right um, <clears throat> and so um, she told this story on the floor of the Senate and a very old curmudgeonly senator um, came up to her who actually come to think of it spent another thirty years in the Senate after that <laughs> um, like twenty years at least because he just died. 2009, I think. Anyway, so Harry Bird. It was it was Bird. Like I don't I don't name him in the book. You don't, yeah. yeah. But like, um, came up to her after after she gave the speech and said, you know, we don't do that here. We don't tell private stories. This is the Senate floor. Have some decorum. You should be talking in facts and figures. He was like, this is you don't tell some sob story of some man. Who cares? You know, like he was like, you should be only talking about substantial substantial evidence and legal ease. You know, and he was like, and that's it. And she said, I'm very sorry, Senator, but that's not the way I talk. And she was like, to me, the most important thing is to tell the impact of real human lives. And, um, and, and he sort of stormed off. And then years later, he came up to her and apologized and said, you know, I've always regretted saying that to you because you're right. It is very important to tell about you know people like the impact on a very personal level of all of what we're doing, and he was like he was like I've completely you've completely changed the way I do things, and you women have completely changed the way we function on the Senate floor, and he was like so thank you for that. Yeah, and now look even even Ted Cruz is telling his personal story. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to say, but towards the end of his life, I mean, Bobby Bird spent a lot of time on the Senate floor talking, crying over his dead dogs, and like. <laughs> you know, so he Can definitely took far. that. He, he took that advice to heart. <laughs> so there, you also write a little bit about this and the 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 way women are judged when they're running. And I there was a fascinating George Packer piece about Angela. Merkel in uh, The New Yorker, where he talks about the one sort of entourage member that she always travels with is her hairstylist. Because, mm -hmm. not because she wants to change it, or because she wants to look exactly the same every single day. So no one will comment on how she looks. They'll just <laughs> listen to what she says. So how do these women juggle sort of that and those expectations? And have, have they just learned to live with it? or? or yeah, so there's a lot of great stories in the book about appearance. <laughs> um, I, one of the best was uh, Michelle Bachman, who I was like, wow. I mean, she, it was, she was, she frankly, she was one of the, that was one of the few interviews that really floored me. Because um, her proudest moment was when the Wall, that was in the Washington Post style section wrote a piece about how Michelle Bachman was so perfectly turned out in the 2012 campaign that like that appearance was never an issue. Um, and she sort of set the bar for all future, you know, presidential, like, uh, you know, female candidates because she was so perfectly turned out. And she was like, that was like the best. And I was like, she, and I was like, that was the best moment of your campaign. Okay. <laughs> um, and so, but she, I mean, it was, I, it, she kind of epitomized how hard it can be for women because she was so worried that people would talk about her appearance and judge her for her appearance that she would not sleep on the campaign bus. And you have to understand how grueling these campaigns are, right? Like, I mean, you sleep maybe three or four hours a night. You sleep a lot on buses in between events because, I mean, like a lot of the times you've got like three or four hours between, you know, on the campaign, whatever. And she would refuse to nap on the bus because she was so afraid she's gonna like ruin her makeup and hair um, and have to like fix it later on that she just wouldn't sleep at all. And so she was a crazy person. Like her staff was like, she was like an, a crazy person because she was so sleep deprived, right? And like, so she was like, and she talked about how the hardest days of her campaign were, uh, was, was in South Carolina in the summer and she would give these stem winder speeches and maybe a hundred degrees outside. And like, she was like, my face would melt off. And she would, I, she was like, she would go into her bus shower, completely take off all of her makeup, hair, everything, and then restart over again. It would take her an hour and 45 minutes after every speech to re-put herself back together again. Um, and like, so that's, they can think of the advantage just in terms of time like that men have. I mean, they can like fall asleep in their crinkled suit and get up and rough their hair and they're done. Like, you know, <laughs> like, um, and like, it's just, it's just in terms of pure time management, like the advantage there, right? 
um, let alone like um, the sort of pressure for like the distraction when somebody does talk about your appearance, right? Like so, Hillary Clinton said a thousand things written about her appearance, and you would think by now people would stop talking about it. But I remember covering her when she was Secretary of State, and we were in Burma, and it was like the first time the Secretary of State had like visited Burma in like 50 years, and it was this really like historic visit, right? And we were normalizing relations with Myanmar, and and. Um, and so she has like a very sedate nail polish, right, on her fingernails. Um, but she lets her, um, her her manicurist pick whatever color she wants for her toenails. And they're always like really funkily colored because the only people <laughs> who ever see it are like her family members, like Bill and Chelsea. And so um, she had to, she was going into a temple and she'd take off her shoes and she had these insane like crazy purple toenails. <laughs> and, and like, and, um, and, Literally, like the bulk of the stories, like 60% of the coverage coming out of Burma was like Hillary Clinton's toenail polish, <laughs> and like, and not anything about like the historic, you know, like normalization of relations between the U.S. and Burma, <laughs> which is like amazing to think. But um, yeah, I don't know. And like, my, actually, I think, but I think there is something that I don't think you should never not talk about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, if if uh, if you authentically like doing your hair, right? Like, if you if that's you, if you're a girl and you love. Like, I love getting my nails done, like, authentically. You know what I mean? Like, I, that's me. And so, um, and, and I, so one of my, like, Chris Quinn, who was one of my co-fellows at Harvard, told me this story where she had, you know, she ran for mayor of New York, and she's the only person, I think, who's ever been accused of being too tough to be mayor of New York. I mean, this is a city that elected, <laughs> like, Rudy Giuliani and, like, Ed Koch, you know? And, 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 and yet, um, and yet she was, you know, she's, she's this really can I say badass? She, was, she like, is. She's yeah, she she badass. I'm just wondering what I can say. But like badass, le badass lesbian, and and um, you know, and she's she's such she's such an effective city council speaker in New York City, but she everyone was like, oh, she's too tough. She's like she's she's a bitch essentially, and um, and she, she had all these requests to talk about her hair, and she, I don't know if you've ever seen Chris Quinn, but she has this really short red hair. Red, not in like a natural sense. Red in like a very unnatural sense, and so, but she used to talk about how. It was like part of her economic development program because she spent so much on her hair, um, like that she was like re like <laughs> reinvigorating New York, and she's like, <laughs> and like, and she's like best friends with her hairdresser, who's this totally fabulous gay guy, and like, and so she used to talk about it in her stem speeches, and so there was all these requests to like interview their her hairstylist and to write about her hair, and she was like, no, that's so sexist. You would never ask Bill De Blasio to write about his hair, and she really regretted it because. Um, you know, she lost the race, and like I think in part because she was perceived as so tough, and she that she was not humanized, right? And she felt, and that is legitimately her. She loves to get her hair done, right? So she she you know she just sort of opened up and let people write about that side of her, and not said you know automatically that's sexist. I think it would have really helped soften her image and humanized her and seen a really fun side of her, right? But I um, mean, so I think that's always the problem, like a real sort of. Catch 22 for female candidates is, you know, how far do you go like being authentically a female candidate, a woman, like being yourself, and how far do you like also have to be sort of thread that needle of being capable and tough and running in a man's world? You write about how you covered Hillary in 2008 and um, how you may yourself have been a little harder on her mm -hmm. than maybe you should have been. Do you do you talk to your female peers in the press about how much sort of self awareness is is there? How much looking inward as there is, how are we covering this? What are we bringing sort of to the table just as women covering women, as women, covering women or women covering men? Where? I think, yeah, we that? do talk about it a lot. And there's, you know, this time around, um, there's a lot, there's a critical mass of us, frankly. I mean, it's so different covering her this time than it was in 08 covering Hillary, um, which was much more male heavy, that press corps. And there's like 16 or 17 women from national outlets covering Hillary. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I think I've written this time around or, you know, has maybe also because I just wrote a book on women, but like <laughs> it's like stuff that I would never have written in 2008, you know, and I just um, like the whole debate over, you know, unqualified to be office versus disqualifying votes. And that's like, I know it sounds like quibbling, but there's a really large history of, of women being told they're unqualified to run. And so there is like a very kind of sexist um, trope to that to say somebody like Hillary Clinton, who has been, you know, Secretary of State and a Senator and a First Lady to say she's unqualified in her life experience to run for office versus the argument, very justifiable arguments that you could say that she's taken decisions in her career that disqual disqualify her from leadership, right? Like, 
the emails or the you know Benghazi or you know Iraq. I mean, you can have that debate, right? But those are specific decisions that you can debate on whether or not she made the right choices versus a, a body lifetime of work, which I think is clear that she's qualified, right? <laughs> like to, to run for this office. And so, but like these are not debates that we ever had in 08. I mean, do you remember ever having no, anything like this? It was, no, it was it was a lot about personality and not a lot about um, yeah. And and like and and, it, and it, it's interesting because I mean I've and I've spent a lot of time this time writing about her difficulty in dreaming, and you think about the 08 campaign and how soaring Obama's rhetoric was and how inspirational hope and change and the moral arc of the universe and like and um, and Hillary again this time around I mean both times really has been stuck as like the kind of mom you know being like. Like and we no Bernie, we we can't buy that jet ski. We have to pay for college, and it's like <laughs> um, it's like this very, you know, limiting role for her, and in both of those campaigns, and so, um, and and it's hard because women have a much tougher time dreaming and inspiring and um, kind of rising above, uh, and it's just not a role that we see many women do, and it's I think it's incredibly difficult to do, unfortunately. So I could ask you a million questions, but I have to let these people have a chance. So <laughs> there is a mic going around. If any of you have questions, please don't be shy. Raise your hands. Women first. <laughs> I'm interested in how you gained access to like the more intimate interpersonal relationships of both parties. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, um, so did everyone hear the question? Yeah. OK. So. Um, so it was interesting. I have a background in politics. Obviously, I've been covering politics for 14, 15 years now. Um, for the political side, I, I was really well sourced. But the chapters on um, like women in the boardroom, women in, in the private in private office, in, in the public in the private sector, chapters on women in the military, women in female in law enforcement. Those were a lot more difficult because um, it was like a whole new universe for me. Women in Hollywood, Silicon Valley. I was like, I was like, I was, you know, I really was sort of introducing myself to them and saying. Look, I'm I'm writing this book on women. I hope you'll talk to me. Um, and there wasn't the same, I think, level of trust. And so I think some of those chapters, um, I tried to make them as intimate as possible. But I think almost inevitably, the, the 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 public chapters ended up feeling more intimate, just because I had I've known a lot of these women for years and years, and I have very personal relationships with them. And so I'm gonna end up feeling a lot more sort of inside. Um, and also, it turns out. When you're on a board, um, you have to sign non-disclosure forms, and so you can't talk about what's going on inside the boardroom. So it just it's, it became a lot more difficult to to talk about inside businesses because there's a lot more money at stake, there's disclosure at stake, there's things like that. So it ends up being end up being a lot more sort of anonymized stories of like, well, woman X on board on like board Y, this happened, you know, and it was it was just it, it's hard to do. Um, but um, so yeah, I think that was it was a fun for me to explore those universes and, and I think it was great and, and then I once I started I was like oh my god I want to do a chapter in like women in medicine and women in religion like female priests so interesting and like you know and then I was like I really want to do um, one on pop pop music if you think about women rule pop music right like who's the what's like, can you think of like one male pop star beyond like Justin Bieber like there's nobody and so it's amazing, um, like the you know Taylor Swift and her girl posse, and like all these. Cool things. It was like a lot of cool stuff going on in that in that sort of genre. But my editors were like, "No, we need to finish the book now because <laughs> 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 Hillary Clinton's running for office, and so is Carly Fiorina, and you interviewed them, so we want them to, the book out now." <laughs> so, um, so the sequel. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, thanks for being here. Um, earlier this year for a class here, we read uh, a piece that came out of the public policy school, some research that a professor had done that argued essentially that um, women policymakers were more effective because, because there are so many barriers for women getting into office. Um, only the most effective policymakers are the ones who actually get into office. It's not necessary, and it essentially argued that it's not necessarily that they are more uh, like collaborative or cooperative. It's just that the best policymakers are the ones getting to the table um, because they're because it's so difficult for women. What to what extent do you think that that argument is valid, or that it's more just, or that it's more what you talked about about women being more collaborative and cooperative and effective? Um, well, I guess two things on that. One is. Um, I, I do think that you know, getting women to run for office is a lot more difficult than getting men to run for office. And so, you talk to people who recruit, like you know, for the DS for the 
the, the DSCC or the DCCC, which is like the two organizations that get people to run for on the Democratic side or the NRSC and the NRCC on the, Demo on the Republican side. Those are the groups that get people to run for, for the House and the Senate. Um, and you talk to those recruiters, and, and like I've interviewed a lot of them, and they're like kind of funny about it. They're like, you'll ask these phenomenal women like 15 times, will you please run for office? And they'll be like, no, I need to like read all these briefing books before I even consider it. And they like, they have to know like every policy and every decision they could possibly ever vote on before they will even consider running for office and how it would affect their families and everything else. And they'll go to like guys and they'll be like, do you want to run? And they'll be like, yeah. <laughs> like before even the sentence is even done, they're like, yeah, I'll run, I'll run for office. What do you want me to run for? <laughs> like, and, like, um, and so it's like, again, it's the kind of like being comfortable and functioning on a lot less information and putting yourself out there with a lot less information. I think women are very uncomfortable with that. And um, so I think that the women that do come into office, you know, there's a great study about women on corporate boards, for example, where women so over prepare for corporate board meetings that they actually, when you get 30% women or more on those boards, they actually force their male counterparts to come to the boards better prepared because they, they like can't function on like the lower amount of information they're used to functioning on. Um, and so I think it's sort of similar with Congress and that they, um, and, and from what I've seen of legislative offices, that they're way over prepared for these things. Um, and they and they just don't often have the confidence to um, speak up until they've really overstudied. Um, so I do think that, and I you know I remember Barbara Mikulski once said to me, who's like the dean of the Senate Women from from Maryland, who's you know the longest serving woman ever in the history of Congress. Um, she was like, it will be a mark of true progress when we start electing mediocre women to Congress. <laughs> um, and so I think that that pretty much says it. I do also think though that. A note on like Hillary and an and executive office, there's a really big distinction between running for legislature and running for lower office than there is running for executive office. And so um, because it, 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 women are, um, are perceived, because they're perceived as good at collaboration and good at win-win scenarios, that often helps them get elected to boards or to Congress or to things like that. It, but it hurts them running for executive office because they're perceived as bad at command and control decision making. And so there is a capability and toughness test that women face for executive office that they don't face for lower office. Um, and that is a really, really tough needle to thread to, um, to show that you are tough enough and capable enough while still remaining likable. Um, and that is, I think, one of the most difficult things for women to do, which is why you see so few women in executive office. Only six of our nation's 50 governors, um, less than 17% of mayors, and obviously never a president. So, To that point about the corporate boards, it much was written in 2008 about Hillary making Barack Obama a better candidate. Mm -hmm. Do you think this time around Bernie might be making Hillary a better candidate? That's an interesting question. Um, so. Interesting. I, I do think that, like, do you remember that first debate that they had, the very, very first one, and it was on health care, it was moderated by Karen Tumulty, mm -hmm. and, like, he was so unprepared for that <laughs> debate, oh my god, she just wiped the floor with him, you know what I mean? Like, um, and I think she did make him a better candidate, because there must have been 32 debates, I mean, for it was for every week we were debating for yeah. like two years, it was crazy. Um, and I think he got a lot better because he was facing her. Um, I don't know that you, I, I don't know that you can argue that Bernie made Hillary a better debater. Um, I think you could argue for sure that Bernie has had an impact on her legislative and on her policy wise, right? So she's definitely gone to the left in terms of student loans and on Wall Street reform and on um, Citizens United and on trade. So there's like a, a number of issues where she noticeably has gone to the left, um, and I think he's had a big impact, which I think is. You know, made made the progressives very happy to some degree that you know that she has had such a, that he has such a lot of influence on her. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think if he makes her a better candidate. It's her. It's hard because he's so like he he really is great at he's very inspiring. You know, and like um, you know, it's there is <laughs> this is a funny story. I it's a the 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 best person that ever explained to me why they were like this was a young woman, the best millennial, I guess you could say. And I'm a I'm a cusp millennial. Like I'm the older older older. older part of that generation, but this this 22-year-old girl in Vermont, um, no, it was actually in New Hampshire, right before the New Hampshire primary, she, we were at a Bernie event, she was explaining to me why she was gonna vote for Bernie versus Hillary, and um, she'd been to Hillary events, she'd been to Bernie events, and she was like, if you think of going to like a political rally, like going on a date, and she was like, you know, <laughs> Bernie like, sweeps you off your feet and it's like revolution and like you know and it's like I'm mean, like gonna change the world and it's free health care and free school and it's awesome and you leave like feeling like you're part of a movement right and then she's like and then you go to a Hillary event and it's like 
it's like going on a date with an accountant and she's <laughs> <laughs> and she's like talking about like saving for college and your mortgage and like and like all these things that you know are really important but they're really boring um, and like and so I don't know that he's made her a better candidate in that sense <laughs> um, I think that's a tough tough argument for him <laughs> for her <laughs> yeah So speaking of uh, command and control, I've noticed that you've covered a lot of uh, major emergencies and disasters. So Katrina and Joplin and the Haiti earthquake. Um, so that's the area that I work in. And by far, there are literally almost zero women in executive level command and control for public safety and emergency response. I uh -huh. mean, Juliet Kayyem, who's also at Harvard, yeah. she writes for the Boston Globe. She was a big figure in the BP oil spill. But I'm just wondering what your thoughts were. Did you think about these issues as you were covering those major disasters? And do you have any thoughts on why there are literally no women in command and control when it comes to these big disasters. That's so true. And That's it's funny, because you're right. Again, I've done a fair amount of disaster reporting. Um, and yeah, there are some, there are some women. Um, but I think a lot of it is because, um, frankly, a lot of the first responders, or to some degree, a lot of the charities that go in are religious-based. And you know, they're not a huge number of those tend to be more male-heavy than they are female-heavy, talking about female priests. Um, yeah, I think there is a sense that um, at that moment of, of true crisis, there's also a huge amount of vulnerability and danger. Certainly when I was in Haiti, I saw um, people executed point blank range. I saw people, you know, um, lynched like in front of me. Um, and, you know, and those are tough situations for men, let alone women to, to do. Um, I, you know, you saw a ton of death. Uh, I think there is like a, you know, um, I'm trying to think, I mean, like, and, it, and it's funny because w war reporting is kind of the flip side of that, right? I think women have a real advantage to some degree, war reporting, because we, you know, when I've been in the Middle East, I can blend in so easily, right? Like, I just put a scarf over my head and I look Middle Eastern and, like, I'm done, you know? And, like, and everyone just, their eyes pass right over me, like, you know what I mean? Like, and, and going into Syria, going into, like, Iraq, that really helped. Um, and they just totally discount you, like, you're, it's as if you don't exist. Um, Whereas like a blonde guy kind of stands out like a sore thumb, um, and so that it's safer to some degree for me to do. And you and you, you talk to like um, special forces like in the U.S. and a lot of the women they work with um, are w women like that in the Middle East, you know. And they um, and they are like it's amazing how effective they are because they can get in and out and nobody notices. Um, but uh, for for disaster reporting, it is. Um, it's true, and I, I don't know why. It's interesting because this we were just having a discussion a couple weeks ago at the UN about this stuff, and I and they were talking about all these implications for critical mass that I'd never thought of, but this is one of them. So they were talking about um, imagine the like what would happen if you had a critical mass um, of uh, of women law enforcement in terms of like border and customs. Um, agents and how the effect that would have on sexual trafficking, which would be really profound, right? Um, or like the UN was also talking about getting a critical mass of women farmers because women husband water differently, they treat the land differently, and they're much more aware of climate change than their male counterparts. And so the effect on climate change that a critical mass of female farmers would have. So this, it's really interesting. I mean, already, and I do think that, and this was the one chapter that like really got my goat in writing the book is is, is women in law enforcement because. It is so clear, like that you should have more women in law enforcement. Like, there's no question. In an era of Ferguson, in an era of riots in Baltimore, women are like every study across the board shows that women exercise the same amount of regular force, but almost never exercise excessive force. Like, 98% of charges of excessive force are against male police officers, right? Um, women draw their weapons like so much less. I mean, their statistics are all in the, in the book, but like Denise Parker, um, who was the governor, the, sorry, the mayor of Houston, said that she had, she commissioned a study on tasers in, in Houston, and they tried to figure out like how many, how often the, uh, the officers drew their tasers. The women actually, female officers did not draw their tasers a single time. <laughs> like none of them ever had drawn their tasers, right? Like women always look for verbal solutions. They're so much better at community building. Like there's all these reasons why you should totally have, I mean like police, you know, you should have female police, and yet there is no national agency, no national group or organization for female police officers in America. The last one went defunct two years ago. 
Um, there's no not like recruitment levels for anything. There's no best practices. Every agency just does it ad hoc locally in all their different areas. Like so, if you're in D.C. and you have a female police chief like Kathy Laner, you have a great like a lot of female police officers. But any, anywhere else, I mean, like they're on average 14% of police in America are women. I mean, that's ludicrous. There should be so much more. So I mean, like I think you'd make a huge impact to have women in law enforcement. Huge impact women in disasters. Um, and, and in war zones, I mean, frankly, it'd be amazing. Great question. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the role of women voters who are going to play in the next election and kind of how that critical mass is affecting how the different parties are responding to female voters uh, and stuff like that? Sure, so um, women voters are, <laughs> talk about a trump card, <laughs> they, they, appealing to women voters um, is sort of the key to winning any election, especially um, on the presidential level. So they are drop off voters, they don't tend to vote in non-presidential years, but um, female voters, this is the, the, the they make up, um, especially single female women voters will make up the largest single voting bloc in America this, this presidential election, which is stunning. Um, women have swung every election since Ronald Reagan. Um, and in fact, it was when, in 1980, when, they, when, Repub when Democrats saw women diverging, like in their vote from men, that's when they drafted Geraldine Ferraro to run on the vice presidential ticket because they thought that they could you know, further that, that wedge and draft you know, get more women to vote for them. But women wouldn't vote for a woman just because she's a woman, right? You have to actually, you know, as millennials are proving with Hillary Clinton, like you have to sort of make a connection and you have to prove yourself. Um, they, but women, so women have, the last time they voted for a Republican was in 1988 with George H.W. Bush. Um, the only time, the only way that a Republican has won the White House since is by mitigating, which is George W. Bush in 2000 and 2004, is by mitigating the loss of women to Democrats to less than 10 percentage points. Um, so generally speaking, married women tend to vote, or vote more Republican. So I think Mitt Romney won married women by 11 percentage points. But uh, single women tend to vote more for um, Democratic. I think Barack Obama won them by like a whopping 36 points. It was like ridiculous. Um, and to give you an idea of how powerful the single women voting bloc is, the Democrats um, made a huge push to get them to turn out in 2014. And if single women had turned out in the same numbers that they had in 2012 and 2014 in the 2014 midterm elections, just that one demographic, if they had turned out in the same numbers, Democrats not only would have kept the Senate, they would have won back the House. Um, but they are massive drop-off voters. They don't vote in non-presidential elections. And okay. so, um, but, so this time around, it is, <laughs> It is kind of ridiculous. I mean, like, and, and this is why it's really interesting. Everyone talks about the, you know, Donald Trump's candidacy and like, and, and how he could really, re, you know, change things and shake things up. But at least for my expertise and with, with like the women's vote, I don't see how it's even possible for him to win the White House because, you know, he, he'd have to come within 10 points of Hillary with women. And right now, his approval ratings with women overall, he's 73 points underwater. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> you'd have to make up 63 points just to come within striking distance of Hillary, let alone his problems with, like, Latinos and African Americans, <laughs> veterans and, you know, Muslim voters and others. It's like, it's just like a long list of these things. So, um, I mean, and so it's a very different electorate. I mean, Republican primary electorates are very different than general election electorates. And Republican primaries, you can win a Republican primary with a split field basically off of the backs of base male, male voters, right? Like male white voters. Um, but with a general election electorate, it's very, very difficult to win, A, without the support of women, but B, without the support of minorities, especially in certain swing states like Florida, Colorado, um, and other states like that. So, it, I mean, it'll be an interesting race, and I don't know how he, he makes up that ground. It'll be very challenging. The Republican women I've spoken to have said that, I mean, what the ones that do vote for him say that they, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. They don't think, they don't believe what he says. They don't think that he's saying, like, they think he's an actor. Like, he's kind of, like, just acting this, you know? And, like, he's saying what he kind of says because he needs to say it or whatever, but that clearly in his personal life, he's empowered women, right? Like, his daughter, Ivanka, is very powerful. She's very accomplished. And they point to her as an example of, um, of how you uh, would be, like, of what he might be like as president, empowering women. So we'll see. We have time for one more question. I have a quick follow-up to that, though. What do you see down ballot for women in 2016? Do you see a lot of... 
You do. Um, I mean, so I don't know if it'll be a year of women, um, but there's the potential for it. I don't know if it'll happen. Um, so re Democrats have five now challengers. I have to think about this. Um, so one of them lost, who is Donna Edwards in in, uh, in Maryland. But you have Katie McGinty in Pennsylvania. You have, um, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to remember all of them, Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire. You have uh, Tammy Duckworth in Illinois. Um, Oh my God, I'm going to totally forget all of them. But anyway, there are, oh, yeah, there's fun. the woman in North, the North Carolina, a woman whose name I can never remember. Um, and then there's one more. Uh, so there are five potential seats that you, oh, and then in California. Um, no, actually, sorry, there are five potential pickups with two, two seats already held by women. So, um, so there, there are five potential pickups for women, um, net, I think. Uh, um, and that, so there's the potential, if all of those races go the right way, to increase female participation in the Senate from 20 to 25, um, which would be a leap, frankly, mm -hmm. I mean, if that happens. But we'll see. I mean, I don't know if that's going to happen. And then in the House, there isn't the recruitment wasn't as good this year. So I don't know that there's going to be much of a leap. Okay. One last question. Hi, uh, my name is Becky Planchard. I'm a first year master's student at the Harris School of Public Policy. We're actually reading your book for one of my classes. <laughs> oh, wow, that's so great. Uh -huh. It's Women in Public Leadership. Awesome. Um, it's great. Um, I'll, I'll discuss it with you. Um, <laughs> but I, I'd love just, I guess, for a closing note, what would be the one biggest takeaway that you would hope the women in my class would have from reading your book? Um, what would be the one thing you'd one piece of advice from it you'd want to give to future women policymakers? Awesome, I love that question. Um, so, I guess what I my biggest takeaway from the book was I when I first sort of came into the workforce and I didn't pay a lot of attention to these issues to begin with, but I kind of in the back of my mind always thought parity is like a pipe dream that's like somewhere never going to happen down the road, not in my lifetime kind of thing. Um, and I guess I never really thought, and I get for me it was like this kind of unexpected delight that I was like, oh, but not that we don't need parity, we absolutely need parity, but that we can be heard at less than parity, right? You just need to get to sort of that tipping point and you, and you can at least begin to be heard, right? And so I was really excited about that. And I guess I would want a takeaway to be, so women fully came in, women came into the workforce during World War II when the economy demanded it with Rosie the Riveters. Um, and um, you know, otherwise, you know, if the women didn't bring in the crops and build the ships, it was never going to happen. The economy would have collapsed. But it wasn't until the 1970s that women, um, that all the laws banning married women from working were fully repealed. Um, and I think it will not be until the economy demands it that women will fully come into the workforce. And we're actually so close to that. We're right at the cusp of it. And I think that that's really exciting to me. So by the year 2030, the baby boomer generation will be fully aged out of this workforce. And we will be short 26 million workers in America, which is kind of hard to imagine, um, given the fact that we just came through this massive recession. <laughs> um, but like, um, and the only two ways to solve that labor shortfall is one, bring in a ton new immigration, which is hard to imagine with this Congress. <laughs> um, or two, you bring women fully into the workforce. Women already have the training to do it. They make up more than half of college degrees and more than 60% of graduate degrees. And they're just not using them. Um, and if you, just by bringing women fully into the workforce, you almost completely solve that, that shortfall. You bring in 23 mm -hmm. million new workers into the workforce. So, and that brings us really close to parity. Um, so no matter, this is a demographic cliff that's coming, and I think no matter whom the next president is, no matter he or she may be, it's a, an issue that they're going to have to address and prepare for, and it's one that I think is really exciting because there's a real potential for women to really come into full fruition and reach critical mass and, and go beyond that um, in, in our lifetime, which I think is really cool. Thank you, Jay. We just scratched the surface of this book tonight, so I re highly recommend it, and I'll let Steve close out. Well, and please join me in thanking Jay Newton's Mall and Alicia Sam for a great conversation. Jay, Jay wrote this book uh, to a significant degree while she was a fellow at Harvard uh, just, what, about a year and a half, two years ago, right? You were... Yeah, I was... I was um, it was 
well, it was quote unquote spring of 2015, yeah, yeah. and spring in Harvard it was nine feet of snow. So <laughs> like, I don't know if that was counts as spring. It was sort of was ill advertised to me. Well, I mentioned that to say that we hope you'll uh, consider being a fellow here when you have your next book project uh, yes, upcoming. We would love that. <laughs> um, we're also going to let Jay um, move out here into the lobby really quickly before I excuse everybody here, so she can sign copies of her book. I know some of you have already purchased a copy. Those of you who haven't yet and want to do so can um, do so at this table right out in front. Um, and our thanks to the University of Chicago Bookstore for providing books. So Jay, we'll have you go ahead and do that before you're um, accosted and besieged by your many admirers. And you can have a chance to say a few words with Jay. Um, my thanks as well to all of you for being here tonight. And we hope to see you tomorrow night and at our other events later this week at the IOP. Thanks again for being here.